I got, a, I got a question to start off. How many, if you're brave enough to, to put up your hands, and I'm, I'm going to look for hands because I want to how, how many of you have uh, made New Year's resolutions this year? Do you see how few hands there are? That, that is remarkable. There's like, there's like 10 hands. That's, that's crazy. That, that is awesome. Now, of those ones that put up your hands, how many of you have already broke them? <laughs> it's almost the same amount of hands. That's, no, it's crazy. <laughs> That's impressive. One of the reasons why I, I believe that, that the vast majority of us have not made New Year's resolutions is because if you're like me, uh, we've given up. How many would agree with that? <laughs> Look at that. That is awesome. Uh, the, the truth is, the reason why we give up is because, well, we know uh, that every, every New Year's, I mean, we all feel it, whether we, whether we say it or we don't say it, we, whether we made a resolution or not made a resolution, we all feel at the turn of the calendar that we look ahead. It's just, it's something magical that happens December 31st as January 1st starts and we, you know, January 1st that day, the New Year's Day, we begin to think and look ahead at, over this last week at the year coming and we all, whether we made a resolution or not, just determine inside of us, that we, you know, something is going to change, something's going to different, something is hopefully going to, you know, we're not going to have with the same year as last year, maybe it's going to be a little bit better, or maybe, maybe we look at the year, you know, with, without hope, I don't know, we, we, but we all begin to look ahead and focus ahead, and the reason why we stop making resolutions is because, well, we make a determination that we're going to change, we're going to change, and we know that we will change for a season, but we all know that there's a, there's a point in the season where we just go back to what was. Uh, I have a friend that, that owned a gym, and he said, said, January is the best month of the year for the, you know, those who own Gyms, and he says we make more money in January than than the rest of the year combined. In fact, he says January floats us for the rest of the year. And he says the gym is. I said, well, does it get really busy? He says it's really busy for about three weeks. <laughs> and I kind of laughed. I chuckled just like you did because how how many of you have bought you know a six month year gym past and. Used it for about three, four weeks. I've done that. And why do we do this? Why do we make resolutions and then why do we end up drifting back to the same thing? Or we, we make resolutions and we've, and we've done it so, so often, so long that we've just stopped making resolutions because we know what's the point? Well, I, I think one of the reasons that we make resolutions and, and break them or why we've stopped making resolutions is, is because it's almost, it's like... It's like autopilot on an airplane. Autopilot on an airplane is, you know, you, a computer will set a course and set a destination and the plane will, you know, will, will follow the destination. And the, the pilot for a while can take the controls and he can take over and fly and, and take it off course if he wants. And he can do whatever he wants. He can change course if he wants. But the moment he lets go of the controls, the plane will automatically revert itself right back to the same course. And this, this is what happens for all of us, is that for all of us at January, at the beginning of January, we take the controls a little bit and we say, no, no, I don't want to go this direction anymore. I want to go this direction now. I, this, this, this year is going to be different and we're going to go this way. And so we take the controls and we steer it this way for a season. But, but after a while of having the controls, it gets tiring, doesn't it? It gets tiring. It gets, it's, it's work. It, it, discipline is work. And I know there's some of you that say things to me like, you know, I just, I'm just so addicted to the gym and I love working out. I just couldn't do without it. Good for you. <laughs> Before the rest of us, or those some of you like, I just really like eating vegetables and eating well. I do too, if it's on my steak. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> good for you. Yeah, your diet tastes like cardboard. It's great. It's awesome. For me, it's like taking the controls and going, yeah, this year's going to be different. And for me, that's a lot of work. And I can chew on that broccoli for a season. And the entire time I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice to let go and revert back? No, you're all hungry. But... 
But we, we do this, we, we, all, we, all, we all take con- the controls for a while and it gets tiring and we revert back because all of us have this set course inside of us, this, this, this autopilot inside of us that is, that, that it just kind of, it sets our direction, it sets our, our pace. And this is what this series is all about. This series is, is called Minecraft. And the reason why we called it Minecraft is yes, I'm playing off of the word, uh, you know, off of the video game Minecraft. And I, I, I don't mind. My, you know, my 10 year old son Kai loves playing Minecraft. He plays it for hours. And it doesn't bother me at all. And the reason why it doesn't bother me is because what I love about the game is that the game allows you to create your own game. And, and you can basically, the game becomes everything that is set according to your imagination. And I kind of like that. It, 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 makes you think and expand and if you're bored you just create more and you do something different and, and, and I like that and life is kind of like that, that we have you know, this, this playground that we get to play in called, called life and God has given us this way to be able to do this and create our own lives and our own destinies and it, we can create according to that thing but the problem is and this is, this is why we're starting this year with it is, is that is that more this time more than any other time of the year, we begin to see the conflict between our autopilot and, and the discipline of taking the controls. The, the, and and uh, let me put it to you this way. We see the difference between our subconscious heart thinking and our mind conscious thinking. And these things compete. I don't know if you've noticed that. But we have a set course, an autopilot that determines or predetermines our destination and where we get to. And then we have where we will or where we want to get to. And oftentimes these two things don't agree. And the one that wins out every single time is the autopilot, the subconscious. Now, the Bible says it this way, and we're going to, I'll just give you a, a warning. In this series, I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of verses I hate. Okay, these are, this is my list. This is my New Year's resolution to give you all the verses. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of verses that I, that I don't like. And the reason why, I, you know, just because I don't like them doesn't make them true. Probably the reason why I don't like them is because they're so true. But these verses have, have kind of shaped um, at least the last 10, 12 years of, of my life. And and, you know, the book that's coming out next week is, and this series is a compilation of 10, 12 years of, of me frustrated with uh, myself, frustrated with the, the, the battle between my, my autopilot and my, my, myself trying to pilot and control. The difference between me, you know, behavior modification and me tr- just trying to modify my behavior to get to a place and being frustrated and exhausted with doing that and then coming back to resorting and going, why do I do the things that I do? See, Paul said it this way. Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, so he's kind of a, a spiritual guy. He, he's kind of a, a big deal. He's kind of, a, you know, he was the leader of the early church, and, and he's been, you could argue that because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he's been the leader of the church for the last, you know, after his death even, for the last couple thousands of years. The most influential Christian, may, other than Jesus, maybe who has ever lived, and yet Paul Pastor Paul stands up to his congregation in Romans 7 and he says, why do I do the things that I hate and the things that I know I should do, I don't do? I think he wrote that January 6th, (laughs) whatever year. He's frustrated with his own resolution not being, why do I do the things? Why do I resort back to the things that I know I shouldn't? Why do I keep on doing the things that I know that I should? Why am I stuck in the same place that I'm, that I, I'm stuck in? And why don't I do, I know where I want to get to. I know what I should be doing, but why don't I do that? And you're thinking, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking as I'm reading this and going, well, Paul, if you don't got that figured out, the rest of us are screwed. I mean, you're the guy who's supposed to be giving us the answers. The Bible, hello? You're supposed to be telling us what, this, what the answers are. And, and if you're asking those questions, I mean, I, I read that verse and I was like, ah, is there hope for me? Well, yes. There's hope for me, there's hope for you. And, and the goal is in the next six weeks that we're going to be doing this series, is, is the goal is we're going to learn how to reprogram our autopilot 
Because instead of trying to fight the autopilot, it, wouldn't it be just easier instead of just trying to take the controls all the time because it gets tiring after a while? Wouldn't it be just easier to reprogram the autopilot to the de destination that we want to get to? And is it possible to reprogram the autopilot? Yes. And that's what we want to do. Because we want to make, this is my goal, I want to make 2019 your best year yet. I want, I, want to, I want to make 2019 just the start of something new, something different, that from here on out, from this moment out, you're going to be different. You're going to end up in a different destination. You're going to end up in a destination that is beyond your wildest dreams and imaginations. Because where you are where you are right now, good or bad, based on your autopilot. And the reason why I can say that is because Solomon said it. Solomon said this in Proverbs 23, 7. He says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart. Now, what's interesting is that he's, when he, because he just uses this word thinks, it's telling me that he's not talking about the physical organ. <laughs> the physical organ can't think. But he says, as a man thinks in his heart. And I'll just, you know, go through all, the, you know, I'll just skip it and give you the, the Cole's notes version, but experts, theologians believe that whenever the Bible used the word heart in these contexts, Jesus often used the word heart. When the Bible uses the word heart in this way, Solomon uses it a lot. It's talking about our subconscious thinking, our subconscious level of, of thinking. Now, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who's, who's a Christian neural, uh, neuroscientist, she's got a whole long title. It makes her really, really smart. But she says, she's, she, does, she studies the brain, she studies the mind, and she says this, that your subconscious heart thinking, your subconscious thinking, it, it, it thinks 24-7, it doesn't, doesn't have an off switch, it thinks 24-7, it's your autopilot, and it thinks at a rate of 400 billion actions per second. Okay, now, your conscious thinking is only active when you are awake, your conscious thinking it, it, it thinks at only 200,000 actions per second. 400 billion actions per second compared to 200,000 actions per second. Which is, which is why, you know, for, for years, scientists have been teaching us that your brain only functions at 10% of its full capacity. You know, that, that's true when it's, if you're only talking about the conscious part of your thinking, your conscious part of your brain, because your conscious part of your, your brain at, at 200,000 actions per second is about 8 to 10% of, of, your, of your activity. Whereas, contrast that to your subconscious thinking at 400, is 90% of your you're thinking that you're, you're actually using all of your brain, only just using 10% of it when you're conscious. When, when Solomon says, as he thinks in his heart, he's, he's talking about, he doesn't say as he thinks in his mind, he says, as he thinks in his heart, his subconscious. As a man thinks in his subconscious, so is he. That means, he basically says, as your subconscious thinks, this is your autopilot. This is, this is your steering your course, in your, your your determination, your, your destination is determined by what you subconsciously program in you. Now, Jesus said this in Luke 6, verse 45. He told his disciples this. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings forth evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. In other words, and I'm not just talking about sin or, or righteousness. Jesus wasn't talking about that either. The good is what I desire, what I want. The good things that I have in life have been programmed. They, they're good and I get to achieve them. I get to them because that was what's stored in my heart. But likewise, the things in my life that I don't want, that I didn't want in there, the destination that I didn't want or the things that I feel that I lack, that is also a result of, a result of what is stored up in my subconscious thinking. So if I'm going to change in 2019 and beyond, if I'm going to actually follow through on a resolution, I, I have to do more than just take the controls for once for a little while. I have to reprogram the autopilot. I have to reprogram the heart. Now, for the longest time, I thought, well, that's impossible. Yeah, you know, how could it be possible? 
And yet when I saw some of these verses that I'm going to share with you this morning, I began to see that it, it, it not only is it possible to reprogram it, that, that when God talks about, you know, your heart and, and these things, he's not just saying, you know, it is what it is. He, you know, just you got to live with it. You, you've been programmed. Sorry about that. He, says, he also teaches us how to reprogram it because some of us, you know, have things programmed in us that is not our fault. It is not, is not a result of anything we've done. It's not a result of anything to do with us. A lot of what's been programmed in our subconscious thinking happened to us before we were even really consciously aware of that in the womb and as a, as a young child. A lot of this stuff gets programmed in there. And when it gets programmed in there, how do we, if, if it's just, well, that's just the way I am. That's the excuse we always use. Well, I tried, and I, I'm trying to do this, and I'm trying, to, but that's just, that's just me. That's just who I am. you got to take it or leave it. Basically, when we say those things, we give up on the reprogramming of the, of the autopilot. We're just saying, well, I'm tired of the controls. I tried to be nice, Whoop. but that's just the way I am, right? I, I, tried, to, I tried to do this, but whoop, that's just the way that I am. And this is, this is, you know, those phrases are when we are frustrated with giving up on that. Well, in the next six weeks, I want to teach you and train you. And, and throughout the book, I'm going to teach you and train you how to reprogram the autopilot so that we can get somewhere different. Now, Proverbs 16.9 says this. This is one of the verses that I hate that I warned you about. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, I've read this a hundred times, but it wasn't until about 12 years ago I was teaching at a Bible college, and, and one of the students, I was teaching the book of Proverbs, and one of the students, you know, I had, I had them write out, you know, you know, read a proverb a day, and write out one verse in that proverb that stands out to you, and write me, you know, a little report on it. And so he did, and he chose this verse, and he wrote on it, and what he wrote, kind of, it, it shocked me. As, as, he, as I read it, I was like, <gasps> Because I had read this a hundred times and I never read it in the context in which he, he said. What he said was, he said, now imagine if we were to flip this verse. And, and he says, imagine if it would say instead, God plans my way and I choose my steps. He said, and, I, and as, he, as he said that, I was like, well, wow, that's, that's what it should say. In fact, if I was writing the Bible, that's what I would have said, and you're all grateful that I didn't. Uh, uh, but but I, if, I mean, it, what makes most sense is, yeah, no, God has a wonderful plan for me. God made me, he designed me with a purpose, on purpose, for a purpose, and that God has, has chosen my destination, and that I get to choose day by day the steps it takes to get there. Now, to be honest, that's what I believed, and that's how I've lived all of my life. Until I saw this verse, and I'm still trying to reprogram my own thinking in this, until I saw this verse and said, uh, God says it this way. I don't know why he did it this way, but God created us. He says, as your subconscious has chosen a destination and chosen a, a, a way for you, he says, God can only work, and God will work the steps to get you to what your heart, what your subconscious has created. You all don't believe me. Because I'm you're all looking at me like, especially you you really um, religious types, Christian types, look at me like, that's blasphemy. That's no. See, this is how deeply we've we've entrenched, we've believed that that meant no, God chose my destination. I choose my steps. I choose whether to walk towards his promise for me or I choose to walk away from his promise for me. And we live that way. And, we, and what we do is, is we say things, and because we, we live that way, we say things like, you know, we try to modify our behavior to try to get back in line with God's destiny, with God's plan. You got to get back in line to God's plan. You got to get back in line and modify our behaviors to get there. And we, tr we, we focus on our behaviors and on our conscious thinking and our conscious mind and we miss really working on where the heart of the issue is pun intended where the heart of the issue is in your subconscious and God is saying reprogram if you really want to get to the destiny reprogram your subconscious let, let me show you one more one more verse and then 
And then we'll, we'll wrap this up. But one more verse that just kind of proves this point even more. It, Solomon said this, above all else. Now when Solomon says above all else, I'm going to pay attention. The reason I'm going to pay attention is, and, uh, is Solomon was the richest man or is the richest man who has ever lived. And I actually, you know, give a list in the book of the top 10 richest people in history. And Solomon is by far number one. Um, in today's dollars, it's multiple trillion uh, dollars that he was worth. So that alone, you know, he amassed that kind of wealth and leadership that, that alone can listen to. But Solomon's also classified as one of the wisest men who ever lived. And in fact, he's famous for writing 3,000 different proverbs or wise, a proverb is just basically a wise saying. And those proverbs are still quoted and, and still uh, written, you know, books written about some of these statements and these sayings and stuff like this. Thousands, for over 4,000 years later, we're still quoting some of this wisdom and it's still so profound. So when he, Solomon writes one of these proverbs is this one, when he writes a proverb and says, this one is most important, okay, I'm gonna pay attention. I'm gonna say, okay, well, this is most important. And this is what he says. Uh, most importantly, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Now, he's not saying guard your physical organ, because we've seen him already talk about how the heart thinks. He says, now, let's put this in our context. Most importantly, stand guard over your autopilot. Stand guard over your, your automatic, your, your, your subconscious thinking. Pay attention to your subconscious thinking, because everything flows from it. Now, this word, everything flows from this last sentence. In the original Hebrew language, that sentence ends with this phrase. And I'm not even going to pretend to, 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 uh, to say it. Uh, not, 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 I have no idea. So if there's a Hebrew skull in here, you can say it. That's not me. But in the original Hebrew, this is how it ends th that sentence. It ends with this phrase. Now, what's interesting about this phrase, that, that means everything flows from it or the issues of life. That's, that's what that phrase, that's what got translated. But what's interesting is this word right here is often used in the Hebrew language, is often used to define a fence line or a border on a property. Okay, that's the word that was used for, for borders or fences on a property. Now, what's interesting about that is if you put this into context, what Solomon is saying, he says, most importantly, pay attention to your subconscious thinking because it is going to put a border on your life. It is going to build a fence line, a border on your, on your life. Put that into, into relation to Proverbs 16, 9, and what he says is, your heart is going to build the border. Your subconscious thinking is going to build the border, and, your, and, and God is only able to work and step within that border. Now, I don't like that. Just, just putting that out there. I don't like the fact that, well, wait a second. I thought I served the God who is limitless. Yes, we do. We serve an all-powerful, almighty, limitless God. However, and we're going to get into this verse next week. However, David actually said that the Israelites limited God. How did you limit the limitless one? You limit the limitless one when, according to your heart, your subconscious thinking, you build a border and God works within the steps. He steps within that border. The whole purpose of this series is, church, listen to me. The whole purpose of this series is to identify your subconscious thinking. Identify the borders that you've built in your life. And if we can learn how, if we can identify them, then we can learn how to adjust them and we can learn how to expand them. And if we can, if we can see the borders, we can move that and we can reprogram that automatic pilot. We can move those borders and expand it. So, because if we can expand it, then God has a lot more to work with. Is this all right? So let me boldly say as your pastor, okay, Solomon said this as, as a king, as a wise king, as a wise leader, knowing that thousands of years later we'd be reading it. Let me say this as your pastor, above all else, this series is the most important series we've ever done, I've ever done in the church, and here's why, is because in the, don't miss any of the next six weeks. 
And I'd highly encourage you to get the book to study even further and get into connect groups to study even further. If you can, if you can insert yourself in these next six weeks and, 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 say, and say, okay, in the next six weeks, our goal is to reprogram our fence line, reprogram our borders. And if we can do this, your life is never, ever going to be the same again. I promise you that. I, I don't just flippantly say that. I say if you can reprogram your autopilot, you're going to get to a different destination. You're going to get to the destination that you desire, that you that that you crave, that you want, you're going to be able to get there. That the reason why you're not where you want to be right now, some of you, the reason why you, 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 there's a lot more that you're striving for isn't because God is holding you back. It's because you are holding you back. It's because our subconscious heart thinking has built a border. It's not your fault. It's not, it's not that, that we've been programmed. It, it, a lot of what's been programmed in you is not your fault. But that does, because it's not your fault doesn't mean that you have to live with it. You can reprogram it. And, that's what, and the Bible, you see, God wasn't cruel. He didn't teach us this stuff and then say to us, um, you know, hey, by the way, this is, what is, this is what you're created like. You're on your own. Figure it out. He actually gave us a, a map uh, and a plan within the Bible on how to reprogram our thinking so that God can do abundantly more in us. Amen? That's what we're looking for. The, the takeaway for today is this was, is Dr. Karen Lee Leaf said this. She says, your mind is the most powerful thing in the universe after God. Your mind, not the 10% conscious mind, your mind, all, oh, 100%. What we want to tap into is the 100%. If we could reprogram the 90% of our mind that we, we don't even know we use, we can reprogram that, my goodness, the 10% is going to be easy. That's what we want to do. Your mind is the most powerful thing in the universe after God. In this series, I'm going to give you a whole lot of scripture. I'm going to give a whole lot of, uh, the Bible talks a lot about this. I'll give you a whole lot of plans that God talks about. It. I'm also going to give you a whole lot of science and a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of that other stuff. And you're going, well, how does science in the Bible work? It works hand in glove. It works perfectly. God designed all of that. And there's a way. When you start to see the power of your mind and what, what is in there and what you can do with it, it is amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. And your life, I promise you, will never, ever be the same. Imagine. What if we, what, imagine if we could just reprogram the autopilot. Just, th just think about this. It's kind of like the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. Okay, and, and you, and if I could use this analogy, you and I are one or the other. We're a thermostat or a thermometer. A thermometer is, is it, it has no power over itself. It only can report what the outside circumstances give it. Right? So it can only tell you what the outside, it, it's determined by the outside circumstances. And too many of us live our lives based on that. We, we say things, well, the limitations on me, it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not in here, it's not me. The limitations on me, you know, on my finances, it's the economy. It's, it's the, the government that we have. It's the, it's the job that I have. It's the, you don't understand, Pastor Kelly, it's all these things. And what you're doing is you're pointing towards all the temperature. It's kind of like the thermometer blaming the room that it's so cold in here. It's the reason why it's so cold in here, by the way, is that our furnace is <clears throat> needing repair. Going to get, if you're wondering, um, we, we didn't turn the air conditioning on, and we're thanking God that it's warm outside. That's what we're thanking God for. But listen, we can't blame the thermometer because the temperature is low. And a thermometer is going to say, well, you know, it can, but, but a thermostat is different. A thermostat, if the furnace is working, a thermostat is going to determine the circumstances. It's going to, it's going to set the temperature outside of it. So instead of, instead of blaming the temperature of the economy, instead of blaming the temperature of the government, instead of blaming the temperature of, of your boss or your job, and, and blaming the temperature of your, of your, your spouse or your, your kids or your whatever it might be, blaming the temperature of all your circumstances around you, why, why not set the temperature? Why not, why not say, well, I want, I, I want to take responsibility, and I, I'm not going to make excuses anymore for what's going on there. I'm going to set the temperature. I'm not going to say it's difficult, you know, to, to reach people for Jesus in our community because don't, you don't know how the temperature and everyone, da, 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 all the excuses that Christians make. Oh, you know, don't understand what society's like, and you don't understand, da, da, da. No, no. How about, how about we set the temperature for what the, what the spiritual atmosphere is going to be in Lethbridge? 
in Canada, in the world. That's, that's what we're on mission for, to reprogram our autopilot. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that you give us answers to the questions that we have and that you don't make it difficult and out of reach and far-fetched, but you, God, you make it right there for us to be able to work in our own hearts and lives. And we just pray right now that you would um, strengthen each one of us. Holy Spirit, work in each one of us and help each one of us in this coming year to, to be aware of, of circumstances around us, be aware of the subconscious thinking in us, and God, to, to focus on our fence lines and to see the change. Lord, I pray in this series, God, I'm asking you that, that you would do a breakthrough in, in our lives, in my life, in, in those who really want it in here, Lord God, that this would be, we'd be able to reset our autopilot and, and, find, and align with your purposes and your will in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, the best way to reset your autopilot, your heart, is to, is to kind of surrender to the, <laughs> the creator. Invite the one who created it in there and saying, hey, help. Uh, I, I'm quoting a country song here, but Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> you can't believe that. I even know that. Song. Anyway. <laughs> But if, you're, if, you, if you don't have yet to have a relationship with Jesus, man, what a great way to start the new year by saying, yeah, I want, a, I want a relationship with Jesus. It's not joining our church. It's not joining a religion. Not at all. It, it's a personal, personal relationship between you and him. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul said it this way. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer together. Let's confess with our mouth that Jesus is God. And if you're confessing this for the first time and you believe what you're saying is true, right here, right now, you can begin this relationship with Jesus. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's pray this together. If you're watching online, pray it with me wherever you are. Uh, let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe that you rose again. And so I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and Savior, and my friend. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen.